Guys, this is Mobin. We are talking about pulmonology. The lecture today is about the carbon dioxide transport. So, in this diagram, this is these are the blood vessels. This is a circulation system, and this is an RBC, and this is an RBC, and RBCs are circulating in here with the help of blood. This is lung and alveolus of the lung, and here this represents our body, which is the tissue. So, carbon dioxide emerges is generated from the tissues and then it goes all the way to the lungs and is exited from there. The question is how does it is how is it produced here and why does it go there and get out? Why does it come to the lungs and go, go out? So let's talk about it. First of all this is tissue so there are multiple cells here. I've taken one cell and in this one cell as the metabolic metabolic activities are continuing we have pressure of carbon dioxide building. What happens is aerobic respiration, oxygen is consumed and carbon dioxide is produced. The carbon dioxide when it is produced, it creates a pressure inside the cell and that pressure is normally 45 to 47 millimeter of mercury. Where then the carbon dioxide diffuses outside into the interstitium. Interstitial pressure is usually about 44 millimeter of mercury. So just one millimeter of mercury difference is sufficient to allow carbon dioxide to move out of the cell and diffuse into the interstitium. From the interstitium then this carbon dioxide is going to go into the blood circulation system. Imagine this is a capillary, this is the venous end and the carbon dioxide is going to move in. How does it move in? What is the pressure gradient here? Remember all the movement is because of the pressure gradient. The pressure gradient here is that we have PaCO2 is about 40 millimeter of mercury. So of course arterial blood comes here. When it will pick up carbon dioxide it will become venous blood. At this time it is arterial blood and the pressure is 40. So what is the difference now between these 44 to 40 about 4 or 5. So the difference here between them is 4 to 5 millimeter of mercury. That pressure is sufficient to move carbon dioxide from the interstitium into the capillary. Now inside the capillary we have RBCs and proteins and other stuff. Let's see what are the three forms of carbon dioxide. Let's handle them one by one. Before that keep this in mind that we have 4 milliliters of carbon dioxide moved per 100 milliliters of blood. What does that mean? If blood was a bus, if I make a bus here, if blood 100 milliliter of blood was a bus, this one bus will carry 4 milliliters of carbon dioxide. 4 milliliters of car how much how, how much oxygen does it carry 20 milliliters so 100 milliliter chunk of blood will carry 4 milliliters of carbon dioxide from the tissue to the lungs okay so now let's see when the carbon dioxide reaches the plasma or reaches the blood about 0 0.3 milliliters about 0 0.3 milliliters, I'm going to make that here, 0 0.3 milliliter becomes dissolved in here. So this carbon dioxide is dissolved. This is the first form dissolved in plasma. How much about 0 0.3 milliliters? When we have, if you measure the plasma carbon dioxide here, you would see that in 100 milliliter dissolved carbon dioxide total is 2.7. 2.7 milliliters total. So now you say well doctor you just said 0 0.3 milliliter now you are saying 2.7. Yes what happens is if the same plasma goes to the lungs over here 2.4 milliliter of carbon dioxide stays and 0 0.3 
0.3 milliliter of carbon dioxide is moved out. So this bus, this bus that contained 0.3 milliliter of dissolved carbon dioxide when it reaches here, it gives off that 0.3 and 2.4 is still sitting on the bus and it comes back. So in one cycle, 100 milliliter is only giving off 0.3. So the change in volume is from 2.7 to 2.4, then come back and load again 0.3 and go back. So actually, even when the total volume is 2.7 milliliters, the volume that is being circulating is 0.3 milliliters. So that is one form done. Dissolved form 0.3 milliliter in plasma and goes there. Now the question is, we, you'll see in a minute that carbonic anhydrase is an enzyme that will help carbon dioxide become bicarb. So the question many students ask me, they say, well, why is this carbon dioxide not converted into bicarb in the plasma? So please remember the answer to this one. Answer is very simple. Plasma does not have carbonic anhydrase enzyme or the amount of enzyme is very, very low. How low? Inside the RBC, carbonic anhydrase enzyme, carbonic anhydrase enzyme is 5,000 times more or is present and it causes the reaction to be 5,000 times more. So it is present inside the cell, but it is not present here in the plasma. So if you waited for the carbon dioxide to be converted into the carbonic anhydrase out in plasma, then it would take ages. So this is direct dissolved carbon dioxide. Done? So we are done with the dissolved in plasma form. We are done with the total transport volume. Now let's talk about associated with the hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide that reaches in the blood, of course, dissolves or diffuses into the into the RBC as well. Inside the RBC, carbon dioxide itself attaches, so if I make a hemoglobin here, this is a hemoglobin, it attaches to the amine radicals of the hemoglobin. Remember, it does not connect to the same place where oxygen connects. Oxygen connects with the ferrous. This one does not connect with that. It actually connects with the amine residues in the hemoglobin protein. When it connects with there, it makes carbamine. Carbamine. So the carbon dioxide is associated here. This becomes carbamino hemoglobin. Or if I write it, CO2 HGB. This is the second form. Simple thing, it connects here. Although connection of doing this, this connection has some very interesting outcome. We'll talk about that in a second. This, when it goes to this side over here, if we make the hemoglobin as well, So the carb amino hemoglobin, which was carrying carbon dioxide, over here it would release this carbon dioxide and this carbon dioxide will go to the alveoli and be exited. Now how much carbon dioxide goes in this form? About 1.5 milliliters, 1.5 milliliter of the carbon dioxide is transported in this form. So now what is the total? 4 milliliters. We had 0 0.3 milliliter going in the dissolved form, that is about 7 percent. 1.5 milliliter is about 30 percent. The remaining 60 to 70, remaining 60 to 70 is going to move in the third way and that is in the bicarb way. So keep this one in mind and now let's look at what happens in the third form. Carbon dioxide dissolves in, over here carb, carbonic anhydrase enzyme is present that is going to combine carbon dioxide with water and the result is H2CO3, right? H2CO3 then gives off H ions and gives off bicarbonate. Now the bicarbonate 
dissolves out and what comes back in as an exchange for electrical neutrality chloride comes in this is called chloride shift in the tissues bicarbonate moves out from the rbc into the plasma and chloride moves from the plasma to inside of the rbc how does that happen there is a bicarb there is a bicarb chloride channel protein that helps with this exchange what happens to this hydrogen this hydrogen connects with the hemoglobin this hydrogen connects with the hemoglobin and becomes acidic hemoglobin so that is how this whole thing would now travel got it so this is the third form when this rbc reaches the lungs now let us see what happens remember dissolve form we've done the carbamino compound we have done that now the third form the third form is bicarb form you have to keep an eye on the bicarb and chloride and the hemoglobin that is in acidic form now so let's go there what happens so over here bicarb is present here pressure of carbon dioxide is more in this area sorry less in this area right so p a co2 is 40 oxygen pressure p a o2 is 100 so oxygen is coming in and carbon dioxide is going out in the lungs this carbon dioxide moves back into the rbc why does it move back into the rbc so that's a very interesting phenomena it's not that somebody tells the bicarbonate okay we are in the lungs now go back into the rbc but here is what happens when the oxygen comes in so let's make a hemoglobin here let's say that this hemoglobin has gotten the carbon dioxide attached to it let's make one more hemoglobin so sorry this hemoglobin we had already made so let's just this hemoglobin has hydrogen attached to it right so now what happens is oxygen that comes in that oxygen gets loaded onto this hemoglobin it is necessary that this happens this is called haldane effect where loading of oxygen on hemoglobin favors dissociation of the hydrogen ion and formation of carbon dioxide to to unload the carbon dioxide from the body so as the oxygen is loading and it would load on both type of hemoglobins the hemoglobin that has an h ion attached to it or protonated and the hemoglobin that has carbon dioxide oxygen would create conformational change and that would help dissociate these things so now when the hydrogen is dissociated it is going to combine with bicarb in here inside the rbc not this bicarb that would make h2o plus co2 this co2 will get out and go out this h2o would move out now to compensate for this hco3 that we just utilized more hco3 would come in and when the hco3 will come in what do you think would go out chloride would go out done chloride shift has become reversed cool so the result of all of this is that now we have reversed the same factor but what started the reversal oxygen loading if oxygen loading had not happened this reversal would not start so student try to memorize that well the bicarbonate is going to move back into rbc as well bicarbonate doesn't have a brain so how does it move back because oxygen moves into the rbc why does oxygen move into the rbc well the pressure of oxygen here is 40 millimeter of mercury and pressure here is 100 so oxygen is moving with its pressure gradient oxygen is doing what it should do so this is the transport of carbon dioxide 